All right, well, thank you and welcome back. Uh, so today uh, we're gonna be looking at uh, chapter 19 now in um, uh, Michigan's money and banking. And we're gonna look at uh, some of the reasons uh, why we observe uh, very high rates of inflation in some countries periodically. And so our bottom line question is, well, what causes inflation? And if you listen to the late Milton Friedman, uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And so what we wanna do here is see, uh, is there evidence uh, to support that concept? And so the way we'll approach things here uh, is this. We'll start off with some basic definitions. Uh, so let's say P is the overall price level, and you can imagine that as something like the GDP deflator that you're probably familiar with from uh, uh, principles of macroeconomics. Y we'll call real GDP, same thing. Again, that's the real production of, of all goods and services broken down typically by consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. And now what we could do here is if we reflate real GDP by the price level, in other words, multiply real GDP by the price level, we get back to good old nominal GDP, just the, you know, just the final value of all goods and services produced over a particular time period. So P times Y will be just nominal GDP. And then finally, we'll define a uh, plain big M here as the M1 money supply. So again, very standard stuff. So let's do this. Let's take and do a simple calculation. Let's divide nominal GDP by the money supply. And let's make up some fake numbers here just to illustrate the point. Let's suppose nominal GDP is $1,000 and the M1 money supply is $200. Well, using some exceptionally high-powered math here uh, that the folks at MIT might be able to help us, help us with, we see that that calculation comes out to five. Well, what does five mean? Well, five, interestingly, has a very helpful economic and intuitive interpretation. It turns out that if you look uh, over, say, a period of time, let's say a year, for example, Suppose that GDP, nominal GDP with our fake numbers is $1,000 and that the M1 money supply was $200. So what that means is that on average, each $1 of that M1 money supply changed hands or turned over or was spent an average of, pointer here, an average of five times. So that's how we were able to support $1,000 of total spending with only $200 of spendable money. Each of those dollars was spent five times on average. And let's call that the number of times each dollar gets spent as, let's call that velocity. Or of course, we'll cleverly label that by capital V. And so now what we can do is we can arrive at the very famous equation of exchange. MV is equal to PY. So the right side of that equation is just nominal GDP, price level times real GDP. The left side of the equation is just the money supply times or multiplied by the velocity. And those two things have to be equal to each other. Now, and that can be very helpful. That equation all by itself can tell us some cool stuff. But what we want to do is tweak it just a little bit. So let's start with this idea. Well, both sides of the equation have to be equal to each other. MV is equal to PY. That means if the left side, M times V, grows by 10%, means the right side. P times Y, nominal GDP, also has to grow by 10%. Well, what we can do then is go one step further, is we can break down each individual component, and we can write down this equation right here. Now, this is approximately true. We don't need to be exactly true. We just need it to be pretty close. So what that says is the sum of the growth rates of the two individual components, say the money supply and velocity, is equal to the sum of the growth rates of the price level and real GDP. And what's crucial here, and this is where we're going to go, is that that term right there, the percentage change in the price level, is nothing more than inflation. And so here's what we want to do. We want to isolate and take that equation so that we can solve for the price level. So we do some very simple math to it. All we do is solve that equation for the price level. So on the left side, we have the inflation rate on the, uh, on the left side there. And then that is equal to the sum of the percentage change in the money supply, percentage change in velocity, minus the percentage change in real GDP. And so inflation can be associated with one or more of those three variables, money supply changes, velocity changes, and real GDP changes. So here's what we want to do, is we want to take each one of those three components one at a time and see intuitively how they can affect the inflation rate. So suppose that uh, we start with real GDP. 
So let's assume just for the sake of argument that the money supply and velocity are both fixed. Well, by the equation, increases in real GDP will tend to reduce the inflation rate. In other words, you're subtracting the growth rate of the real GDP figure. Well, that's mathematically pretty simple. Well, what's the intuition? Well, if real GDP rises, what that represents is the spending on the volume of goods and services is tending to rise. And if you fix money and velocity, what happens is this. It turns out that money becomes relatively more valuable. Money becomes relatively more scarce, and so it becomes relatively more valuable. And so what we end up with is either a decline in inflation or we end up with outright deflation. And the idea is really simple. It's, it's turning an old statement, um, an old saying on its head. There's an old, you know, old saying that, well, too much money is chasing too few goods. That's what causes inflation. Here, it's precisely the opposite. It's too little money chasing too many goods. Because again, remember the idea here is that we're holding the money supply and velocity both constant. So it's relatively little money chasing a lot of goods. So the money becomes very valuable. And when money becomes valuable, that's exactly the opposite of inflation. That's deflation. Money has an, an increase in purchasing power. Changes in velocity. Other things equal, if we hold in this situation, real GDP and the money supply fixed, higher velocity will be associated with higher inflation. Again, that's what the equation says. The intuition is pretty straightforward. If velocity is rising, what that means is that each unit of currency, each dollar, is spent more frequently. So even though you have exactly the same number of dollars, each dollar is in effect doing more work. It's being spent more frequently. So it's almost as if there are more dollars floating around out there being spent. But here, they're just being spent more frequently. But the net impact is the same. What you really got is too much money chasing too few goods. Though in this case, it isn't more actual dollars out there. It's the same number of dollars changing hands more quickly, acting as if they are more dollars. Now, let's take a second here and think about what happens or, or what are the factors that determine velocity. So in other words, what are the factors that, that affect the rate at which money turns over? Well, let's think first maybe about interest rates. On average, higher interest rates will be associated with higher velocity. And here's the intuition. Higher interest rates will make it more costly to hold currency. When currency becomes more costly to be held, what people will tend to do is they will start to deposit that currency into the financial system. And when they do that, those physical dollars, the pieces of paper, become electronic dollars. And electronic dollars, it should be pretty intuitively straightforward, electronic dollars can move from entity to entity, person to person, business to business, and so forth, more quickly than can physical dollars. So when a dollar becomes moves from being a physical unit of currency to an electronic unit of currency, it can change hands more quickly. The payment system. Consider back in the days of old when it was just coins and currency being used. Well, there's a physical limit in terms of how quickly coins and currency can be spent. Money has to go from person to person and business to business in a vehicle, by horse and carriage, or, or, or something like that, again, using the extreme case to illustrate the point. Electronic money, as we just mentioned a minute ago, can move much more quickly. So as the nature of the payment systems changes, as people use less cash and more debit cards, credit cards, and other things, money can turn, turn over more and more quickly. And then finally, expectations. And I'm going to come back and use this as an example here in just a minute. Suppose that expected inflation rises. In other words, you expect that the price level goes up. What you're going to try to do is to get rid of your money as quickly as possible because we know that higher inflation erodes the purchasing power, erodes the value of money. And so with higher expected inflation, you don't want to be stuck with it. So you spend it as fast as possible, and that tends to translate into a higher value of velocity. And finally here, changes in the money supply. So again, now if we hold real GDP and velocity fixed, the equation says an increase in the money supply 
will be associated with higher inflation. Intuition here is very straightforward. We have a fixed volume of goods, but an increased quantity of money to be spent on that fixed volume of goods. So now, literally, we have too much money chasing too few goods. And so money now becomes relatively less scarce. It becomes very plentiful relative to the volume of goods and services it can buy. And as a result, each dollar becomes worth less. And when each dollar becomes worth less, its purchasing power falls, and that, by definition, is inflation. Now, what we can do here to illustrate the point is we can come up with some examples of hyperinflation. So not surprisingly, uh, a you know, number of uh, authors uh, have looked at and examined uh, 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 incidents of hyperinflation. And so what we've got here is we have uh, six of the most famous ones, and these are uh, based on the highest monthly rates of inflation in history. And so the bottom line column is that right there. And so notice uh, post-World War II Hungary uh, in 1946 had an inflation rate in a month that was so high. And again, remember, this is a monthly inflation rate that was so high that you need scientific notation to measure it. And inflation was so high that every 15 hours, so within less than a day, prices doubled. More recently, we had, as Aaron mentioned in a previous uh, video, we had Zimbabwe. And he said that the inflation rate was a gazillion percent, I think. Well, he lied. The inflation rate um, in 2008 over a monthly period was only 80 billion percent or just thereabouts. And so what that meant is that the price level was roughly doubling literally each and every day. And so we're going to return to these examples here to illustrate uh, how the causes of these can be associated with very large and very rapid increases in the money supply. And so we have an example here of a $100 trillion uh, note issued by the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. That's their version of uh, the Federal Reserve. And so that's $100 trillion. I have one of those. It was a gift for one of my students. And they're available on eBay, and they are they don't cost really very much. They, they go for maybe four or five bucks or so. Uh, so I'm a 100 trillionaire, but it doesn't get me very much, unfortunately. So here's what we've got then, is we have three possible culprits for higher inflation. An increase in the money supply, higher velocity, lower real GDP, or obviously some combination of both. So here's, or you know, some combination of all three. So here's what we want to do is by process of elimination, we want to back into the idea that it's mainly that that's going to generate inflation over time. So let's first think about real GDP. So for inflation to persist over time, real GDP would have to continuously fall. So our previous example, I said, well, gee, if GDP rises, that should push inflation down. The reverse is also true. Lower GDP should tend to push inflation up. It's now too much money chasing too few goods, and the reason it's too few goods is because the volume of goods has been declining. Well, the problem here is if you go back to the table we just had a minute ago, you had these obscenely high inflation rates. In order to get those obscenely high inflation rates, by blaming simply a decline in real GDP, you'd need declines in real GDP that are simply unimaginable or, or not possible. Reason being is that over long periods of time for most countries, you don't observe decreases in real GDP, you observe increases. And moreover, when you see declines in real GDP, they don't last for very long. And finally, by magnitude, a really large decrease in real GDP for any country would be 10%. That would be a catastrophic decline in real output. Those don't occur very frequently. In fact, they're exceptionally rare. So the bottom line is this, lower real GDP is not a good candidate for or as a cause of higher inflation. Well, how about velocity? Well, now here we've got at least some plausibility. The idea being that velocity can rise very quickly and achieve very high rates of change. And so we can, that can be correlated with very high rates of inflation. In other words, money changes hands more quickly. Well, here's the problem. Why would it be that suddenly one day people wake up and decide to spend more money and spend it more quickly? Just because it's Tuesday or because it's cloudy or something? Well, no, we don't have a really good explanation for why people would simply just out of nowhere increase the rate at which they spend money. 
But here's one thing that we can look at that might be really interesting. This is what I mentioned a minute ago. Suppose that inflation expectations rise. And maybe inflation expectations rise because they observe or expect the country's central bank to start rapidly increasing the money supply. Well, if they start to expect the money supply to increase rapidly, they might expect prices to go up. Well, what's the rational thing to do if you've, you're holding money and you expect prices to rise? Yes, it's exactly that. It's to go out and buy stuff before the prices go up. And what you end up with is this. You end up in the extreme case with a bad, bad game of musical chairs. The last person holding the worthless money loses. So without exaggeration, with very high rates of inflation, people literally spend their money as fast as they possibly can. Because consider the examples that I showed in the table a minute ago. In very short periods of time, prices were doubling. So literally, every minute, every hour that you held currency, it was losing value. So there was enormous incentive to go out and spend it as quickly as possible. So therefore, velocity was tending to rise. So now we get down to this, changes in the money supply. It turns out that in each and every case in the previous table there, that all of those hyperinflation episodes were associated also with extremely high rates of growth in the country's money supply. And there's also many, many others that weren't severe enough to make that table. But there's lots and lots of other examples in this. So those are, those are not, the, not the exceptions to prove the rule. And the crucial point is that in terms of timing, is that the inflation rates were preceded by time by changes in the money supply. So think for a minute why that's important to the story. So you need some timing. You need the money supply to go up in order to generate the inflation later on. And so you need the timing, and then you need rapid, large in size, and then sustained increases in the money supply to generate the inflation rates that we saw in our table, you know, measured in the scientific, uh, measured with scientific notation. And here's another important point. It isn't just the increase in the money supply that generates the inflation. It's the reinforcement effect by the increase in velocity. Because as the money supply rises, which has its own effect on inflation, people go out and try to spend that additional money ever faster and ever faster. And so both those factors work together to generate those exceptionally high rates of inflation that we've observed. And so here's a question. So if we go back to our, our table here, why, in the name of all that is good and holy, would any central banker in their right mind ever allow the money supply to grow at rates that generated inflation rates like that, or anything even close to that? Well, that's a story for another video. And it turns out that there are reasons sometimes why central banks end up doing that. Thank you very much.